Hello everyone, and welcome to my channel. Uh, this is an educational channel, and we generally uh, look into great theories of everything, ancient and modern, and uh, try to help the uh, viewer figure out how to best use these things for their own edification and, um, you know, formation of a holistic worldview and uh, the awakening to 5D consciousness. Today is our 529th video that we've done on the reciprocal system of theory from Dewey B. Larson. And uh, Mr. Larson was an American engineer who lived in uh, Portland for his adult life, born in North Dakota, and uh, he died back in 1990. Uh, the 60 years before that, he was working out his reciprocal system of theory, uh, which is otherwise known as the universe of motion. Larson was one of the few scientists to uh, posit a universe that was made out of motion. Not matter, not energy, not force, but motion. And uh, in Larson's uh, estimation, uh, it was what he called a scalar motion. Scalar motion is a kind of a more generic form of motion that has a magnitude but no specific direction. It's kind of like an intrinsic motion or an emanating motion. You can visualize this using a balloon and uh, you put dots on the balloon. If you blow up the balloon, all the dots are moving away from each other. Every dot is moving away from every other dot. But they're not moving in any specific direction. Really, every dot is moving in every direction away from every other dot. It's like the uh, balloon itself is expanding, and so the motion is, is coming from the inside, and um, he calls that an outward scalar motion. The inward scalar motion, if you contract the balloon, um, would be the opposite. He refers to those as the progression and gravitation, and uh, you know, again, those motions don't have any specific direction. So it is a kind of a more um, flexible kind of motion. And uh, uh, it can really uh, replace uh, many different kinds of motion. Uh, you would have your translational motion, your vibrational motion, your rotational motion, and your rotational vibration and they all kind of fit under that umbrella. Um, and then the other major thing about Larson's system is uh, the re reciprocity. For Larson, motion is the relationship between space and time. And that is a reciprocal relationship. So um, motion, uh, everything is made out of motion. So all of our scientific quantities, mass, energy, force, pressure, electric charge, magnetic flux, um, all of our magnetic and electric quantities are forms of motion. And they can all be expressed using um, a fraction with space or time as the numerator and time or space as the denominator. Uh, the most basic kind of motion that you can think of is speed. Um, I was walking at three miles per hour, three miles of space in one hour of time. That's speed, space over time. Uh, but space and time can have multiple exponents. So you can have matter, for example, which is time to the third power over space to the third power. And you can see the reciprocal relationship there between space and time in a fraction. Um, 
you know, if you say I'm gonna gonna double the speed, you can now say, well, now I am walking, power walking, at six miles per hour. Um, you can, or equivalently, you can say I was power walking at three miles per half hour. Um, so you can either multiply the space or divide the time. They are, they are equivalent and the same. And so that's kind of how the system works. Larson's first postulate just uh, states that the universe is composed entirely of one component, motion, existing in three dimensions, in discrete units, and with two reciprocal aspects, space and time. Okay, so there's really like four prongs there. The universe is made out of motion, in particular scalar motion. Um, motion comes in three dimensions. Motion um, and, you know, everything is made out of motion. Uh, everything is in discrete units. Everything is quantized. You don't have fractions. You have full units of everything. You have to have a full unit before you have anything. And then um, that space and time relationship. So that's kind of what he gets started with. And then he plugs it into really his second postulate, which is that the universe conforms to the relations of ordinary commutative mathematics. And its primary magnitudes are absolute and its geometry is Euclidean. And so he takes those two postulates and derives a theoretical universe, what his universe would look like if his postulates were correct. And then in many of his books, he compares his theoretical universe with the uh, measured universe of the modern scientists uh, that they have uh, measured in their laboratories and compiled in their scientific tables. Uh, for example, he does that in the last book that we looked at, Basic Properties of Matter on Chemistry. Larson arrived at uh, his theoretical universe, which includes equations for many of the basic properties of matter, like the melting point of different uh, elements or compounds. And then he compares his theoretical values with the actual, um, you know, experimental values of uh, modern science. Now, today we are uh, looking at one of Larson's books on economics. Um, we've already looked at books of Larson on physics, chemistry, a little bit of astronomy, metaphysics, including psychology, religion, um, philosophy, a little bit of biology, and um, some of his colleagues have done work on meteorology and geology. Um, and so now we're looking at Larson's work on economics. He's got two books, one on macro, one on micro primarily. This one is the macro, the, uh, it's called The Road to Permanent Prosperity. So I think everybody would be interested in that. And um, so this kind of gives you some insight into how Larson applies his reciprocal system to very different subjects, in, uh, in this case, economics. Uh, now, we are uh, delving into chapter four of this book called Value right now. And uh, if you want to go all the way back to the beginning, uh, you probably want to go back about a week um, and uh, start from the top. But otherwise, we're going to take over right here. Uh, also, if you want a little bit more detail about the reciprocal system and how it operates, um, watch any of my first 474 videos on this subject. But for today, I'm just going to start up with the economics discussion. And hopefully you can um, fill in the gaps and, and, um, and understand it. If not, you probably want to go back and watch some of the old, older videos um, that are more introductory. Okay. Uh, chapter four. Uh, we're kind of toward the end of the chapter. Hopefully we can finish it today. The real issue involved in the value controversy is whether or not 
the consumer should be allowed to make their own choices. The Marxists and others who see the situation from the sociological viewpoint take the stand that most consumers are not competent to judge what is best for them and that the decisions should be made by individuals who are better qualified. Furthermore, it is the contention of the Marxists that there are aspects of the production decisions that are the concern of the state rather than that of uh, the consumers, and that these decisions should therefore be made by government agencies. Whether or not these contentions have merit, they are social and political issues, not economic issues, and have no place in economic science. And again, uh, in the first couple chapters of the book, Larson is talking about making distinction between economic science, which is factual, and sociological economics, which is value, you know, which is based on your, you know, political orientation. And he's trying to, um, you know, be... Uh, what Ron Satz called econophysics, that, you know, uh, the first step in, you know, coming up with an economic system is come up with one that is based on reality, based on the facts, and based on, um, y you know, how things actually operate. And so he's trying to boil this down to a scientific study. Thus far, we have been looking at value from a good standpoint. And that's what he says, Larson, the, um, you know, the uh, iron law of economics is work or starve. And the two major aspects of econo uh, economics are production and consumption. And um, production... Uh, creates purchasing power, consumption is of goods. So, you know, you really have goods, uh, two different aspects of goods. One is if you produce the goods, then it's purchasing power. If you consume the goods, then it's goods. Um, okay, so we will now want to recognize that the value concept also applies to labor. The labor unions are vehement in their contention that labor is not a commodity. But this is a sociological point of view, not an economic judgment. From the economic standpoint, labor is the equivalent of a commodity, inasmuch as it is bought and sold in the same manner as commodities in general. We may therefore define the value of labor in the same manner as the value of goods. The value of the labor of a particular individual to a specific individual or agency at a particular time and place is the maximum amount which that individual or agency is willing and able to pay for it. This definition has to be modified in application to self-employed persons, but we can express essentially the same concept in self-employment terms as follows. Quote, or, this is the definition, the value of the labor of a self-employed individual at a specific time and place is the value of the goods that can be produced by the most productive use of that labor. Like goods, labor has both a buyer's value and a seller's value. The buyer's value of labor is determined in the same manner as that of goods. But the seller's value is subject to some other considerations. An important difference is that labor, as such, has no value to the worker other than that which he can realize from an immediate sale, whereas goods, as such, normally do have a continuing value to their current owner, at least for a time. If a proposed goods transaction fails to materialize, the owner holds the goods for some subsequent transaction with little or no loss in value. But if an expect, uh, expected labor transa uh, transaction fails to develop, the potential labor 
or a portion thereof is lost and whatever value it might have had simply disappears. Thus there is an element of urgency about the labor transaction that is usually absent in the case of the goods transaction and this plays an important part in economic life. To some extent the loss due to the failure to utilize potential labor may be offset by the leisure that is made available. Free time, which can be devoted to consumption, rest, recreation, or any other purposes which the individual has in mind, is a means of satisfying wants, and from an economic standpoint is the equivalent of goods. Leisure thus possesses economic utility. There are no different varieties of leisure as there are of goods, but the utility of leisure and the corresponding value are extremely variable nevertheless. Arbitrary restrictions placed upon the activities of individuals decrease this utility. For the, uh, to the prisoner in solitary confinement, free time is merely idleness, leisure of zero value. Restrictions imposed by economic factors have the same effect to a lesser degree. The person who is able to take a vacation at the seashore or go on an ocean trip is usually securing more utility from his leisure than the individual who must spend his vacation at home. In general, the availability of additional income, goods, increases the utility of leisure, while additional leisure facilitates the consumption of goods. However, in spite of the parallelism between goods and leisure so far as utility is concerned, there is a significant difference in origin that has a major effect on value. Goods are produced by means of effort, whereas leisure, like the ability to exert effort, is a part of man's original endowment. We cannot create more leisure in the way that we produce more goods. We have a certain amount of potential leisure to start with, representing all of our time, except that required for the functional processes of living, eating, sleeping, etc. But we sacrifice part of it in order to produce goods. The remainder is the amount available for enjoyment. Since we cannot increase the original allotment of time, the only way by which a leisure can be increased is to decrease the amount of time devoted to production. Because production is essentially fixed in the short run situation, this means reducing the amount of production. This is one of the fundamental economic problems facing all individuals and economies. How shall we balance more leisure against more production? Unless all available time is required for production of the bare necessities of life, there must be a choice. One cannot spend all of his time on production and also enjoy it as leisure. It has to be one or the other. If the individual himself makes the choice, it is normally based on his appraisal of relative values. If someone else makes the choice for him, it may be purely arbitrary without regard for the value relationships. In any event, the choice is always there. Leisure cannot be increased without forfeiting production. An individual may, of course, obtain both leisure and the goods if he can shift the productive burden to someone else by one device or another. But this possibility is not open to the community as a whole. All individuals cannot simultaneously transfer the burden to others. Here we have an illustration of the desirability of studying the simple forms of economic life before passing on to those of a more complicated character. 
The facts pointed out in the preceding paragraphs are self-evident uh, so far as the isolated individual is concerned, and once we get this picture firmly in mind, it takes but little additional consideration to make it apparent that the same principle holds good no matter how large the economic unit may become or how complicated its organization. Additional leisure, shorter working hours, more holidays, longer vacations, etc. cannot be obtained without cost. It can only be gained by sacrificing the goods which could be enjoyed if this time were devoted to production. The utility of additional increments of goods decreases as the income of an individual rises. And since utility is one of the de determinants of potential value, the potential value of these additional goods likewise decreases. On the other hand, a rising income usually increases the utility and the value of leisure since it widens the range of pleasurable activities, which the individual is in a position to undertake. In general, therefore, the value equilibrium shifts in the direction of more leisure as the income rises. The value equilibrium between work and leisure is also affected by the nature of the work. Some tasks are difficult. Others are easy. Some are so uh, distasteful that they will be undertaken only under the pressure of extreme need. Others are agreeable enough to induce carrying them out for their own sake, irrespective of any income that may result therefrom. When we wish to strike a balance with respect to any particular item of production, it is necessary to take this situation into account. The difference between one type of labor and another due to variations of this character may be considered either as an element of cost or an element of value, depending on the point of view. If we take one of the more agreeable tasks as our reference level, the more arduous or more di disagreeable work involves an additional cost. If we move our reference level to the other extreme, the more pleasant work represents the addition of a certain amount of value over and above the value of the goods produced. Both methods of treatment are correct and they arrive at equivalent results. The difference between them is merely a matter of where we put the zero point. In this work, we will, for convenience, Take our zero at the level where the nature of the work has no effect on the values. Any additional effort or other element which makes the work more distasteful, we will call a cost. Any satisfactions arising out of the labor other than its productivity, we will call value. This need to assign an arbitrary position to the zero level is one of the factors which makes it desirable to define cost and value in commensurable terms. By so doing, we arrive at the same answers irrespective of the location of the zero. Where wants are few, the preference for additional leisure manifest itself quickly. Some of the early economists were puzzled by what appeared to be the, a failure of the usual laws of supply and demand in application to primitive societies. Simon Newcomb, for example, cites the case of an importer who was obtaining certain handicraft items from a South American Indian tribe. Finding a ready sale for the goods, the importer decided to pay a higher price so that he could stimulate production uh, in accordance with the rule that an increase in the price increases the supply. Much to his dismay, he found that the higher price 
actually resulted in reduced production, as the Indians simply quit working after earning enough for their most urgent needs, and at the higher price, that point was reached earlier. Here then, says Newcomb, was a case in which a law of economics was completely reversed. The advance of economic theory has cleared up this situation and it is now recognized that the early day economists were in error in regarding it as a supply and demand problem. Instead, it was a value problem, a question as to the comparative values of additional goods and additional leisure. These particular Indians had never cultivated any strong desire for additional goods, and they chose the leisure. The present-day labor unions who press for a shorter work week and longer vacations are making the same choice, although in this case the economic organization is so complex and the factors involved are so perfectly under, imperfectly understood that few of those who demand the additional leisure realize that either they or some other workers must pay for that leisure by forfeiting goods that they would otherwise receive. An equally prevalent misapprehension is that work itself, or employment, which is the aspect of work that is the center of attention in the modern economy, has some inherent economic merit, independent of the goods that are produced. Crusoe would never be deceived by any such specious doctrine. In his simple life, where economic relationships are clear and unequivocal, it is obvious that work, which does not produce any economic value, simply sacrifices leisure to no purpose. But as economic organizations have grown in complexity, this direct connection between gain in leisure and loss in production has been covered up by a confusion of detail. And we find that in the modern world, much effort is devoted to work, which cannot possibly produce sufficient values to justify the accompanying sacrifice of leisure. Even worse, so much confusion has been introduced into the picture that there is actually an influential school of economic thought which contends that employment in itself creates economic gains even though no values at all are produced. Under some circumstances, non-economic benefits may perhaps be derived from work that produces no economic values, particularly if the alternative to, un uh, to employment is idleness rather than active leisure. But the contention of Keynes, Beveridge, Murdahl, etc. is that unproductive employment is economically beneficial, and it is this contention that must be categorically repudiated. All labor comes from individuals, whether or not they work in conjunction with others, and these individuals sacrifice leisure when they devote their time to work. If the sum total of the values placed on the potential leisure by these individuals is greater than the values produced, the employment has decreased economic well-being rather than increasing it. If no values at all are produced, the entire value of the potential leisure has been lost. No shifting of goods between individuals can alter these facts. As long as a loss in values is incurred by the unproductive employment, someone has to bear it. If arrangements are, are made whereby those engaged on the substandard work are compensated in money or goods for their labor, the loss is merely transferred to others. Okay, that is the end of chapter four on value. Uh, chapter five here is called Concepts and Definitions. And so Larson is going to kind of get into the meat of his theory here, I believe in chapter five and six. Uh, I don't know that we're going to uh, uh, go verbatim for the whole book. I might be summarizing some of the later chapters, but at least uh, uh, up until 
uh, chapter six or seven or eight or so, uh, we're going to, you know, just read the uh, text. Uh, so we'll figure it out. But um, thanks for tuning in today. And hopefully you'll come back tomorrow and catch uh, chapter five on concepts and definitions of the road to permanent prosperity from Dewey B. Larson. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great day.